Friday, December 9th, 2022, Maneco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. Today we have Clive Thompson on again. Uh, we spoke for the first time uh, about two weeks ago on the 24th of November, which was uh, a Thursday. And we spoke about the current reset, the currency reset, excuse me, uh, and how it would wipe out creditors and usher in uh, maybe CBDCs. It doesn't necessarily mean it, it would, but there's a lot of talk about CBDCs. We spoke about central banks, uh, balance sheets as well, specifically the Federal Reserve. And there were, of course, a lot of questions from the viewers. And uh, uh, I'm surprised uh, how many views we've got. And we're still getting views today, and we're almost up to 400,000 views. So, uh, Clive, welcome, uh, and uh, nice to see you again. Thank you. Good to see you. Um, would you like me just to start, for the benefit of you, the viewers who didn't see that video, with a very brief summary of how I think the CBDC and reset might occur? Yeah, um, yeah, and uh, maybe if you could tell the viewers that you're not pro CBDC, we're here just giving our opinions how things could happen in an ideal world. We wouldn't have uh, central banks controlling uh, the way we uh, spend our our money. Uh, so yeah, just want to put that out well, there. Well, that's absolutely the case. I'm not a big fan of it. Um, having said that, uh, it will perhaps when you know how it's going to work, the particularly the programmable part, influence the way you might want to hold your money uh, going forwards. Um, we'll maybe get to that much later. Um, just first of all, the world's got a big financial problem. Governments are very indebted, severely indebted. And it's a bit like if you max out your credit card and you borrow a bigger and bigger percentage of your income, uh, so your debt gets larger and larger, there ultimately comes a point when you can't even pay the interest and the banks say, you know what, we're not going to lend you anymore and they put you into bankruptcy. Um, and I think this is very much where most of the central banks of our world have got to today. The levels of debt they've got as a percentage of the GDP of their respective countries is higher everywhere than it's ever been before. Um, if we take the United States, for example, back in 2011, uh, they had a debt reduction plan, which was supposed to bring the debt down from about 19 something percent down to 60 percent by now and 30 percent in 10 years time. Uh, that's clearly not going to happen because the U.S. GDP debt to GDP ratio is um, up in the 130s now. Uh, and the same applies to other countries. They're not going to get be able to get rid of the debt. So sooner or later, we reach a situation where the taxes aren't going to be enough to even pay the interest on the national debt. And then it becomes, um, I think we're already there in a certain sense, a bit of a spiral where the government has to borrow money to reimburse the maturing debt, and it has to borrow money to pay the interest on the existing debt. And that situation can only get worse and worse. And to some extent, over the last um, decade since 2008, or to a large extent since 2008, the only buyer or the main buyer of government bonds has been the central bank itself, which means the central bank's balance sheets have exploded to a very, very high level, meaning that they're holding a large amount of government debt, um, whilst at the same time um, paying interest to the banks who put deposits with them. And I did touch on this last time. Interest rates have risen to about 4% in the United States, so they're paying up 4% to the depositors. Um, they're only earning probably one and a half or two or two and a half percent on the bonds. So they're losing money at the moment. And that's visible on the Federal Reserve balance sheet, um, on the Federal Reserve's uh, website. You can see that. And their capital is being eroded. Uh, the capital relative to their assets now is a very, very small proportion of their assets. Uh, I think it's something like 200 to 1. That's an extremely leveraged position for any company to be in. It's not a company, but it would be extremely leveraged if it was a company. Um, and it's only a question of time before somebody shouts wolf and, uh, you know, everybody runs to the door. Um, now, what we're going to get to the point about how a, a CBDC might come in or a reset might occur. I think this comes from some sort of crisis. As you know, we have crises all the time. Um, I can't say what the next one will be. Maybe people will be out in the streets protesting because they can't afford the food. Maybe the, the cost of heating their homes is too much. Uh, maybe there'll be some unforeseen event. Uh, but if there is a crisis, 
um, we could have a total loss of confidence in the currency of the country concerned. And that would be the opportunity for them to do two things at once. One, introduce the CBDC. And secondly, do a reset. And by a reset, I basically mean you don't get the right to convert all of your money into the new currency. Uh, you're told you'll have to wait. Some of it can be converted later. Or maybe uh, along the lines of what they did in Brazil, where um, we, we were just talking before about the collar plan. Um, in that particular reset, uh, you could convert some of your money and the rest was lent to the government. Or we could talk about the German reset, um, which was, I think, in what year was that? I just wrote it. Yeah, that was in 1948 when they reset the German currency in the British, American and French zones. Um, you could, at that time, change 60 old marks into 40 new Deutschmarks. The next 100 marks only got six and a half Deutschmarks. Um, rents, salaries, and pensions were converted one to one, which was fine for the people who um, had jobs or pensions. Uh, but realistically speaking, it wasn't the greatest thing for anyone who had a lot of old marks. They didn't get to convert them very at a very good rate. So the winners in all these resets were those who hold held tangible assets, property, equities, or businesses in those days, gold, silver. And you can probably think of some new things in the crypto world that uh, people might like to hold and consider assets today. Uh, but obviously, uh, paintings and works of art and collectibles of all kinds have held their value when they do a reset. Yeah, and maybe fine wine as well and stuff like that. <laughs> um, well, you know, I think we'll get exactly, we'll, we'll get on to some, one of the big questions which was asked uh, by people is, what do I do about my money? I've got a lot of questions along the lines of, I've sold my house, I'm looking to buy another one, I'm scared to death, or I'm going to get an inheritance, or I've got an inheritance, don't know what to do with it. And uh, we, uh, without giving investment advice, I'm going to certainly tell you what not to do, but I'm going to give you a long, long list of assets, which people probably haven't even thought of, which they might want to look at. Um, a good example would be doing a house extension, if you own one. Uh, that's right. That's right. And the when you spoke about the the Brazilian uh, reset, that was in 1990. The caller plan. He was the first. I, I looked into it, and I remember at the time I was not living in Brazil anymore, but I heard a lot about it. Um, the caller plan, and he just become president on March 15th, 1990, and he was the first elected president since they got rid of the military. Uh, uh, government that since 1964. And it's really weird. I, I looked into you sent me the color plan in English. And uh, do you know what day, day that was? It was the uh, March 15th. And some people think, so what? Well, that's the Ides of March. So he became president and uh, uh, reset uh, things. And that reset, though, was done one to one. Uh, you know, the uh, the uh, he, he brought in the third Cruzeiro uh, and got rid of the Cruzado Novo, which was the new Cruzado. It's very confusing because they had about uh, two resets in uh, since 1986. And, and uh, yes, uh, and then I, I looked through uh, Brazilian resets. And in 1942, there was one, 1967, 1986, 89, 90, 93, 94. So in the last uh, since 1942 brazil's had three resets uh all of them were one to a thousand so you got uh one of the new currency for a thousand of the old ones except for the the color plan which was only less than a year after one of the resets so it was one to one but like you said they uh they froze a lot of uh bank accounts and deposits i think they froze 80 percent of the deposits and overnight yep. deposits and savings because they wanted to uh, freeze uh, prices to stop uh, inflation and they couldn't have people spending. So that's why they froze the deposit. And like you said, they, uh, they allowed these people to get their money in, in 18 months time in drips and draps and pay them only 6%. So uh, yeah, and I've got here an example of all because I like collecting coins and also old currency. So I've got a, a Cinco Cruzeros. This was uh, after the first reset in 42. They brought 
the Cruzeiro. Before that, they had the Real, which was the currency in Brazil since colonial times. So there you go. Very nice looking paper, but it's just uh, for collection now. It doesn't buy anything. And then they they went to uh, the one that I remember, the Cruzeiro. That's from the seventies, and I remember that because my mom sometimes used to give me that to go when I went to school, and that was quite a bit of money. Like in the mid late seventies, you could buy, you know, a, a sandwich, a, a coke for for lunch at school, and still have some change. And then they moved to, and then by the late eighties, is still the Cruzeiro, but they started doing a hundred. Cruzeiro, which was a huge note at the time. And then they, they changed to the Cruzado after the Cruzero. There's a hundred, but inflation got really bad again. And they had to bring in the thousand uh, Cruzado note, but then they, they had the, the new Cruzado Novo, which they just stamped. <laughs> they put a, mm-hmm. number, a one to a thousand. You can see there. So I, I don't have the, uh, the new well, the new currency in Brazil has been around for 28 years. So actually, that's not a that's done relatively well. Maybe they learned uh, the hard way in Brazil. But the, maybe, uh, Clive, you can talk about the who benefits and who loses out from all these resets. I, I'm very well aware of it because I, I lived in Brazil and I could see it. But uh, I'll let you uh, take yeah. over. Um, I, w- I was smiling when you showed me those banknotes, uh, in particular when you said you could buy a, a sandwich and a Coke with it. Um, when I started work, we had something called luncheon vouchers in the UK. And I re- remember the luncheon voucher I used to get, it was 15 pence, and you could buy your lunch, a uh, sandwich and a Coke or whatever with that. Uh, of course, you couldn't even buy a cup of coffee with a, with 15 pence these days. You'd need about 10 times that uh, if you're lucky, and certainly not in Starbucks. Um, who benefits and who loses? Well, in all of these resets, the um, the losers have been those who hold large cash balances or bonds in the old currency, because the old currency um, either is eliminated completely, or as I think might happen in the current reset, it'll be allowed to continue, but wither away in value. So the losers will be those who hold a lot of cash or a lot of bonds. And one of the um, suggestions I'm going to make to people is think of something you can do with your cash or bonds, which doesn't involve leaving too much of it where it can wither away, uh, either due to very high inflation if nothing happens, or if something happens, uh, you might find it going away much faster. Um, as far as winners is concerned, I hate to say the idea that oh, I hate to say that there will be winners. Um, in a certain sense, it depends which way you look at it. Uh, we could say that everybody's a loser uh, because after a reset, a lot of the wealth on the planet will have been wiped out, and that won't really leave any winners. Or I mean, there'll be people who stand pat. I mean, if you don't have a lot of money, you'll be just the same as you were before. Um, but there won't really be any winners out of that. But from a different sense of, or a different point of view, those who hold the tangible assets, if they now revalue those tangible assets in the old currency, which is withering away, they'll find those tangible assets are worth more in the old currency, but less in the new currency. So it depends which side, where, you know, the glass half full or the glass half empty, how you look at it. Um, but the, the underlying message is you want to be in assets which will hold their value no matter what the government does to you. Um, would this be perhaps a good opportunity just to sort of uh, nominate, name a few of those assets? I, I, I wrote yeah, a, sure. quite a long list of them. Sure. Um, I'm just, just going to pull them out. Um, for example, uh, any, any property will be good, um, or at least will hold some value. Uh, land, uh, and I'm going to talk about what might happen to rents if you're a land owner in a minute. Um, you could hold equities because even though we might go through a period when it's difficult to trade equities or you could only trade equities for the old currency, um, I don't think that's necessarily going to be the case. We'll definitely get to a point where you can sell your equities for the new currency. You'll definitely get to a point where we can sell your property for the new currency. Anything collectible. And uh, for that, you need to be an expert in the thing you're collecting. So some people like to collect old dolls. Some people like to collect paintings or furniture, um, uh, numismatic coins, uh, any, anything that you can think of which is collectible. Things which you could use are going to be very useful. Um, 
I'm going to give you some, perhaps some ideas we haven't thought of, but animals. You know, animals will always have a value. I mean, we mustn't forget in many parts of the planet, your wealth is the number of cows you have. Now, this isn't an option available to most people, but uh, if you happen to want to own a rare dog or um, uh, or you have a lot of land, getting a few more sheep or cows might not be a bad idea. Uh, machine tools or tools of all descriptions will still be valuable. Electricity generators, um, I, if you have the space or if you have a place for a fire, Firewood could be useful because you're going to use it down the line. Um, even things that you're going to use later, like washing powder, uh, obviously that takes up a lot of space, but uh, we mustn't forget in the uh, Soviet Union days when they're letting out 50,000 Jews a year to Israel, they didn't know what currency was. At least they didn't know what currency existed on the West, and some of them thought the best idea to go on the direction of Israel was to bring washing powder with them because they thought they could use that. Um, and I'm not saying that's uh, any sort of a recommendation at all, but uh, if you want to buy up a little bit of the things you might use in the future now, tinned food, it's not such a bad idea to do it now uh, to reduce your cash balance because those things will still have value to you. I'm not saying you buy them to trade them later, uh, but certainly they'll have a value to you if you buy things you might need in the future. And if you don't have a lot of space um, to put all those things you're going to buy, uh, I can recommend perhaps thinking about a house extension. Uh, that's a way to use up an awful lot of money. And then you'll have the extra space to put any, anything else you buy. Um, and uh, so th those are some ideas that I can give to people for deploying their cash. Uh, the real problem, of course, is if you've got the cash and you need to spend it down the line, perhaps on a new house, what do you do? And uh, all I can say to that type of person is hurry up. Um, right now, we're in a situation where a lot of people are holding off on their house purchases because they're sure that house prices are going to go down. And we read that in all the newspapers that uh, house prices fell 2% in the UK last week, for example. Um, and I think I heard something in, on the news this morning about American house prices falling uh, and the forecasts are for them to fall much further. So people have, who are buyers have stood back from the housing market waiting for the prices to go lower before they deploy their cash. But that actually is creating an advantage for those who have the cash waiting to buy a house because they will be more alone when they put in an offer. So the buyers know the prices are going down, but the sellers know it too. So there are some very motivated sellers, sellers who are in a chain, sellers who are dealing with a deceased person's property, uh, sellers who've got too much debt and need to raise the cash, uh, sellers who are going through a divorce, there's a lot of motivated sellers in the housing market. So now is a very good time to be putting in a lower ball offer and just see if your seller accepts it. Yeah, because there's always a danger that um, prices uh, might not go down as much as people think in nominal terms, but uh, in real terms, they are. And your your cash is just like sitting there and, and the, the house price is not going down as much. Uh the other thing I would say about all the resets in Brazil, uh, going back a little bit to what we talked about, is that it creates uh, wealth inequality, uh, big wealth inequality, and learning about these six or seven resets in Brazil since 1942. Uh, and I had an idea of it, but it, it's one of the reasons why there's so much wealth inequality in Brazil. It's gotten a little better because the people who have assets, they, they survive. And like you said, they, they're not huge winners, but they look like big winners uh, next to everyone else. So that's one thing I would add. Uh, Clive, uh, could we uh, go, do you want to go over some of the questions now and uh, uh, about like uh, the debt? <laughs> yeah, a, lot the, people, the, a lot of people are like uh, saying, yeah, oh, should I uh, borrow a lot and just have it wiped out? I think you have yeah. a different view of that. Um, yeah. So the, the big question, which was in many, many uh, um, questions, was should I leverage up, buy as many houses on mortgages, uh, max out my credit card and buy anything I can? Um, my answer to that is absolutely not. When the reset happens, for sure, there'll be people who are in the know ahead of the game, ahead of the time, and they try to game the system. Those people will be despised despised by the government, despised by the newspapers, despised those who, by those who didn't game the system. There is almost certainly going to be some sort of 
evening out process, some new legislation to ensure that those who were the big winners because of the reset aren't as big winners and to show ensure that those who are just at the wrong end of it and unlucky are in some way made not completely whole but to some way in some way compensated so it, it's cons- there's, there's several things which might happen um uh, in uh, uh, in and around a reset um the the first thing is interest rates could go spiraling out of control so if you borrow money you might find you borrow money and get taken out of the market at the worst possible time because as interest rates rise a lot asset prices fall so as that happens your bank might ring you up and say hey that money you borrowed from us lot for last week to buy this new property well we're going to renege on the loan or we want our money back or we're going to call in the loan because your property is only worth half as much as it was due to the spiraling interest rates so that's my first point if you leverage up you might get caught out by an interest rate spike or a falling uh, the falling and or the falling value of your asset if that happens the second point is let's assume that your debt will remain in the old currency and there's no guarantee that's the case it's it was it's my thesis that your debt will remain in the old currency in other words we have all currency all debt remain in the old currency uh, which is good for the government because their national debt's in a currency nobody uses anymore. Um, but the, there's absolutely no guarantee that'll happen. You might find that the government's debt remains in the old currency and they decide that everyone's got a mortgage, has to pay the mortgage in the new currency. Uh, well, that would hurt a lot if you suddenly find your um, old mortgages flipped over one-to-one to the new one where you didn't expect that. Uh, and more importantly, there may be a lot of rules designed to... Um, ensure exactly that happens for those who did in fact game the system so we might find a law coming in saying anybody who borrowed money in the three months or six months prior to the reset when people started to know what was about to happen will have it their debt flipped over but everybody who's had a mortgage for 10 years or 20 years or 50 years whatever it is um, will leave them pat and that's very good that their mortgage is now in an old currency which is withering away uh, so my, my message is do not leverage up. Try to have, play an even bat. Diversify your assets. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. We mustn't forget there's maybe 150 countries which are working on the currency uh, on the CBDC at the moment. And when the first currency country does it, I think a lot of them are going to follow very, very quickly. And if it's the subject of reset, the reset when it happens in one country will will be a global one. It, it, it's going to happen almost within days all around the world. I don't think. England could have a reset and then America decides to have one three months later. I think it'll be much, much faster than that. So things will happen very, very quickly. And because there's so many countries, it will happen in different ways in different countries. So whilst I'm saying that it's quite possible that all debt and all cash and all bonds remain behind in the old currency, and that's great for people who have borrowed money and terrible for those who own assets in the old currency. It's not necessarily the, the true um, in any one country or every country. We just don't know how it's going to play out. So my message is, if you've got a lot of cash, think about what you could be doing with it. Um, unfortunately, when you get rid of your cash, someone else is getting that. So there's always going to be bag holders holding the cash. You can't get rid of the bonds on the planet. So whoever you sell them to, someone else is buying them. They're a bag holder. Uh, you just have to make sure that you are not the bag holder when the day comes. It's like a game of musical chairs. Uh, I, I saw there as a headline the other day that uh, in Nigeria they've uh, uh, limited uh, cash withdrawals to forty-five um, of their local forty-five dollars equivalent because they are testing the CBDC. And uh, do you do you think that uh, they're trying to avoid a reset, or uh, they're just preparing for it in case it happens? What's your feeling on that? Because if you look at, let's say, the budget in the UK recently, they're just talking as things are going to keep going on uh, as normally as possible. Um, well, I certainly am not a conspir- conspirational theorist. Um, so I, I'm not a believer in a conspiracy, which I've heard, uh, which says they're trying to engineer a crisis so that they can do the reset. 
But I think they are prepared because there will be a crisis, not engineered because crises come all the time and they need to be ready to move when the next crisis comes. So, sorry, Mario, did I answer the question? Was the I, I missed? Yeah, it. no, that that's it. That's it. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's the that's what I was asking. And uh, do you think uh, because we saw in Brazil, like from eighty six to ninety four, nineteen eighty six to ninety four, they had like four or five resets. They didn't work. So, do you think there's a a chance that this might not work and we could have actually more than one reset? That's the lesson I learned from uh, looking into the Brazilian situation. Well, for sure, when the reset happens, they'll want the man in the street to buy into it. The way you get the man in the street to buy into it is by giving him some free money. Uh, call it universal basic income or a lump sum. Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> but um, they, they're going to try and uh, pitch it as a sound currency. And of course, if the government's debt is now in a currency which can't affect the economy, um, the, the finances of the government will seem a lot more sound and the need to inflate the money supply will seem somewhat less than they seem today to serve, because they won't have a national debt to service in the same way. Um, so I think it could seem sounder, but of course, maybe nobody will trust it. We don't know that. Uh, and this is why there's an argument that perhaps if we have a reset, it would have to be backed by something tangible, gold, and you can change your money into gold. But if we were to do that, that would involve a huge ratchet in exchange rates because different countries have got different amounts of gold. So, for example, America has a lot of gold and UK has very little gold. I haven't done the ratio, but I can imagine that if the UK was going to make its currency redeemable in gold, uh, they'd have to have a gold price. And I don't want to say a number, but it could be 10 or 20,000 pounds an ounce, whereas America might know they need a gold price. And I did the math on America. It would need a gold price of about eight and a half thousand dollars an ounce. Um, so that would cause a huge collapse in the value of the pound. Uh, and you can imagine this would happen all around the world if every country made their currency, their new currency, redeemable in gold. Uh, they can only make it redeemable with gold at a certain ratio where they have enough reserves to cover that redemption or at least a part of the currency being redeemed. So do you think that could be a reason why a lot of the BRICS countries are, are adding on to their gold reserves? Uh, quite quite aggressively. I I do. I think I think the point is not that it's a definite plan to go to a gold backed currency, but rather you don't know which way the cookie crumbles, you don't know which way the wind blows, and you have to be prepared for that just in case. So that's why they're building up their gold reserves because they might need to go to a better gold backed currency, but it's not their plan. Uh, Clive, do you want to? go over those questions we spoke about uh, or do you think we've covered most of it um sure i, I just uh, let me just have a quick look through some of the notes some of the questions i had yeah i can share uh, share it on the screen if you want uh, can you see it um oh so just it's on this screen i'll move it over yeah uh, yes okay i've got actually i've got it printed out here oh, okay so let's just have a look at um, – there were some questions which I definitely haven't answered. Yeah. Um, so the first question was, so is it correct to say for the everyday poorer person or young first-time buyers a viable strategy to get a mortgage and take out lots of credit cards, debt before the reset, as debt will all be wiped out or much cheaper – it will be much cheaper to clear the debt as the old currency will be, he put, worthless. I'm going to say withering away. Uh, they're not going to make it worthless in a day, I don't think. It will still exist. It will still be an accounting currency. Um, uh, I sort of see more of a situation where you're not allowed to convert all of your currency in one go, and there might be a time lock on the rest of your currency, or there might be a reduced ratio on the rest of your currency, such as we saw in Germany, where the first amount gets converted at one rate, the next amount at another rate, and the rest you've got to wait for. Um, so obviously, I answered the question on debt. No, I don't think you should have large amounts of debt, because yeah. you'll be ga gaming the system, and you will be punished for that, I think. Uh, next question was, 
will the quantity of personal savings permitted a one-to-one conversion rate applied per account or per bank or per individual? Well, there's 151 countries going to do this, and each one's going to have their own rules and their own way of doing it. Um, Obviously, if you have lots and lots of bank accounts and they agree it's per bank account, uh, you're going to be better off than the guy with only one bank account. If it's per, if it's per individual, which would be more rational, um, having lots of bank accounts won't help you. Um, the other part of that same question was, what about the effects on bank liquidity? liquidity? Um, the answer to that is absolutely none because banks will still have a balance sheet which balances. They'll have the same number of liabilities, which is the money they owe the depositors in the old currency, because the new currency will be issued by the government to the banks for the depositors who are changing over. And they will have the same amount of of assets, i.e. the mortgages and money they've lent out to their borrowers uh, in the old currency. So they're, in the old currency, they'll be standing pat. They'll look just like they did before. But what they will have is a whole bunch of investors who now have small current accounts, five, ten thousand, whatever they let you change on day one, in the new CBDC. And they'll be now in competition with the central bank as to whether they lend it out or not. So, you know, you have a choice of putting it, taking it out of the bank and putting it in your central bank wallet, which you'll have on your telephone. Or you can leave it with the bank and they'll lend it to some spotty teenager to buy an Xbox. You take your pick. Uh, Mary, I can't hear you. Are you? I'm sorry. The sound sorry about that. Uh, hi. I hear you now. Okay. So the ne- next question is uh, here, Greg O'Neill. If debts such as mortgage debts are to be forgiven, or at least to rapidly erode as the value of the old currency erodes, and assuming people in the banking industry know what's going on, why are they, uh, the banks, continuing to offer mortgages denominated in the existing fiat currency that they uh, must know will lose the money in the conditions of a currency reset? Well, there's no possibility the bank, of the banks lending you money in a, uh, a, the new currency, of course, uh, at the moment anyway. And it doesn't really matter because banks uh, don't care whether something goes up, whether money goes up or down, because they've got two sides of the balance sheet. They've got their depositors and they've got their borrowers. Uh, so all that matters is that you make a you 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 charge people more than you pay people, and you make a, a profit. Uh, obviously, that's not what the Federal Reserve is doing at the moment. They're paying people more than they're earning. But you know, if you're a proper bank, <laughs> you charge people more than, than you actually pay out your depositors. So they're not worried. They just make a profit on the difference. Yeah, and just a different currency. And when the new currency comes, they will start, they'll keep making profits. Yep, yep. Yeah. Eric, very informative. You covered that bonds that matured would be considered converted into the old currency and that would eventually be worthless. What might happen to stocks? Okay, so first of all, bonds are currently denominated in the old currency. They will continue to be be denominated in in that old currency until they mature. When they mature, you're going to be repaid in the currency which is on the debt instrument, i.e. the old currency, which will potentially still have some value, even though it will be withering away because people won't want to have a currency they can't spend, or maybe you they can spend, but can only spend on limited things. So that old currency will be somewhat um, worthless when it, your bond matures, uh, or in the direction of worthless. As far as stocks are concerned, these are businesses. So you will still own the business. Now, if you sell your stock before the currency reset, you're going to get the old currency, and that's no good because you now have got more cash, and that's not what I'm telling you you should be doing. Or you wait till after the reset and after the stock exchange has sorted itself out, which might take a week or so. I think probably, uh, well, I, I'm going to say almost certainly, you'll be able to sell your stock in the new currency. Now, there might be an interim period where the stocks have two prices, one in the old currency and one in the new currency. That is entirely possible. Um, Just as we see uh, stocks trading in America and the UK, there's two prices. And those prices, the American stock might go up and the UK stock might go down. But all that's changed is the exchange rate between the two currencies. Um, But realistically speaking, if you own a share of business down the line, you'll be able to sell it for whatever the currency is. And that would be the new CBDC in due course.
Which uh, business do you think uh, Clive will do worse in in this scenario? Like, which stocks would you not want to hold, even though the business might survive or not? Well, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty for those who've got a lot of leverage. And there's going to be companies which have got it at the wrong end. Um, So uh, my, my advice would be to be more focused on companies which have... Uh, a lot of financial stability um, in terms of large cash balances or low borrowings, uh, s- steady, reliable income flows um, from annuity-type revenues. Um, I-, I won't name companies here because I don't want to get into the arena of investment advice, but there are lots of companies which have annuity-type revenues. They can't really go away. Um, and they have lots of cash on the balance sheet. Uh, I, I'm sure some of your listeners will comment on it, but I won't uh, for mm. avoid yeah. of investment advice. But uh, those types of companies would be good. Um, I personally don't think it's a brilliant idea to own too many of the financial stocks because I think there's going to be a lot of disruption in this arena. Um, and we do see uh, the risk that, uh, when I say we see, the world sees the risk that certain financial institutions might be struggling to stay solvent at the moment. Um, and what we've seen right recently is a very large rate of rise in interest rates. We've gone from less than 1% to 4% in American dollars. And that's a, uh, in percentage terms, in percentage terms, that's a huge shift. And there always, when this happens, there is always someone at the wrong end of it. So we haven't had any, well, we've had a few minor instances, but we haven't had any major institution uh, go belly up. But it wouldn't surprise me if something happens. And um, it could, e- it, you know, often this happens in the financial world. You know, someone caught it copper or uh, they've got, got a leverage position on treasury bonds or who knows what. Yeah. Okay. Count Pushkin, if one were to keep one's money in Switzerland where digital currency is unlikely to be accepted, would one's financial assets then be protected from being frozen out of the new system? Uh, well, I'm very glad that question got asked. I, I think I made a big mistake last time by suggesting that Switzerland will be immune from the CBDC because I said we have referendums here and people vote on things. Um, thinking it through after uh, we'd done our publication, um, I realize, of course, when the currency reset comes, there's going to be no country on the planet which can be immune. It's going to happen very, very quickly, very, very fast, and Switzerland can't be immune. Uh, So there'll be no question of a referendum. There might be one after the event, uh, but it'll be too late by then. And like uh, everywhere else on the planet, uh, the new currency will be sold to the public as a good thing. It'll be sold uh, along the lines of it's safer, it's more efficient, it's faster, it's more convenient, uh, it's sounder. uh, And oh, yeah, and here's some free money you're getting for adopting it. Um, So it'll it'll be sold to the public in 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 a way where I think even people will probably say that's fine it's no different from the credit card i had before that was digital this is digital um although maybe we should explain what the difference is between the digital world we're in today and the digital world we're about to have because i think a lot of people don't quite get the cbdc shall i just pop in with that yeah sure um so the distinction between digital money today and what's coming Digital money today, you have an intermediary sitting between you and the person you're paying. When I pay my shopkeeper, even if if I use Twint, I don't know if people use Twint in other countries, but Twint is a a widely held card in Switzerland uh, adopted by all the banks. I can pay somebody on a Sunday afternoon. They get the money within three seconds. Could be a friend. Could be anybody. Um, When I pay somebody, it looks like the money passes from my phone to their phone instant, instantaneously. But that's not actually what's happening. My money is being, my, my phone is sending a message to my bank, which immediately debits my account. My bank then credits the beneficiary's bank instantly. And the beneficiary's bank then tells the phone of the person who's receiving the money that he's got the money. So those two banks are sitting in the middle. And I, I saw this the other day uh, when somebody was trying to pay somebody a certain amount of money. And Uh, was informed that he couldn't do so because there's a limit as to how much you can pay on Twint. I think uh, unless you up your limit, it's it's a maximum of about £3,000, something like that, and you can up it, but uh, there's a limit. So 
a financial intermediary was sitting in the middle saying, yes, you can or no, you can't. Now, with the CBDC, the digital system, you will have no financial intermediary. When I move money from my phone to my friend's phone, there's no piggy in the middle saying you can't, well, I might, it might be programmed into the pro- currency, but there's no piggy in the middle saying, take it out of my account and put it in the other pad. It just moves from one phone to the other automatically. It's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's removing the counterparty or the intermediary from that transaction. And the liability for the CBDC is the central bank. In other words, it is literally a substitute for cash in your wallet today, real banknotes. Yeah, and do you think that means uh, commercial or private banks will uh, become obsolete? No, they'll still be doing what they always did. I mean, you can still deposit your CBDC uh, with your bank, but now you're trusting your bank to keep it for you. I see. I see. <laughs> I think I'd rather keep it uh, out of the bank. But uh, anyway, uh, we can move on to the next. Uh, actually, I, I don't know if this question's here, uh, but uh, I, I think I read it. Uh, well, let's just keep going. There's a, there's a question here. Yeah. Realistically, when could this specific event happen at the earliest yeah. or the latest? Yeah. Um. The legislation is being produced and going through uh, various countries at the moment. In the UK, it's in the Financial Services Act, or Bill 2023, which is on the third reading in the House of Commons at the moment. Um, It then has to go through the House of Lords. There'll be three readings there. And after the House of Lords, uh, amendments will be considered. And finally, it'll get the royal assent. That's in the UK. Uh, I don't have the progress in all the countries or uh, really any of the countries, although I know it's progressing. Um, So when this Financial Services Act 2023 becomes law, all the power will be vested in the Treasury to introduce the CBDC in a sudden type of situation, we'll call it an emergency situation, without further ado. Government will then have 28 to 40 sitting days in which they could turn around and say, no, we don't like that. But of course, it'd be too late by then. I see. I see. Uh, yeah, the, the question I wanted to uh, come come across, and it's not on this list, is someone noted that uh, like uh, very wealthy individuals, for example, when they gamble or they do other things that are not very well looked upon, they use cash. And, uh, so, and so this person's argument was that they, they would... Uh, never get rid of cash because of that what's your uh, view on that you know like uh uh, uh like nefar- uh, not nefarious uh, activities but yeah like gambling and other prostitution uh, a lot of top people use cash because they don't want to be tra- uh, tracked um well uh, you could imagine 101 reasons why people might have to use cash and i suppose when we get the cbdc we might have an interim period where the cash you've got in your home can still be used. I, and I'm going to say might, because I don't know that. And it might be different in some countries and so on. Um, but after we have the CBDC uh, and it gets widespread adoption, it is going to become harder to use cash if it still exists, if it's still legal, if it's still accepted. And let's look at some countries like Sweden, where it's virtually impossible to use cash already today. Uh, So I think the direction of travel is one where if even if cash remains usable for a period, it's not going to be usable in the long run. Uh, And those who want to pay will be looking for other means of paying. So if you want to go to the uh, fortune teller, she will say what she always said cross my palm with silver i expect so if you have some silver coins yeah. um that's the way you do it mm. and i won't i won't suggest other uh, uh perhaps more nefarious reasons yeah, why yeah. people might, might want to be paid yeah. but you could you could imagine there's a lot of yeah. undocu- undocumented uh people 
in every country of the world, uh, immigrants, illegal immigrants, uh, for example, who don't have bank accounts. And, uh, uh, and then you've got the, the, the man who paints your house and says, pay me in cash is one price and pay me in something else is another price. Well, who knows what, uh, what will develop to, to deal with that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think also some people uh, have asked, should I keep the old cash at home? Uh, will I be able to use it? I, I think personally, you might be able to use it for a short period of time. But all you have to think about is these old uh, Brazilian uh, banknotes. <laughs> They're useless, useless now. So yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend it personally. Uh, what would happen to a pension annuity paid in old currency? Uh, that's another question here. Yeah. So the the last thing any government wants to do is mess around with the masses. The the, the and the majority of the people in every country are you know the eighty ninety percent are the man in the street who's worked all his life, got a pension. Uh, you can't if they cut that off or continue to allow it to be paid in the old currency, which is withering away to zero. Um, that will cause a lot of civil unrest it's not going to happen so they're going to have to look after the pensioners in some way um i see two possibilities uh one is a bailout for the pension pa plans which uh pay these pensions uh, that would mean they're allowed to convert some of their money all of their money at a certain condition into the new cbdc on a one-to-one -one basis that is possible uh alternatively they might deal with it through some sort of universal basic income for pensioners and say, sorry, your pension's being paid in a worthless currency, but don't worry, here's a UBI for you so that you get, you know, even Stevens. Now, if your pension is very large, uh, your universal basic income isn't going to be very large. Uh, if your pension is just like the man in the streets, you probably won't lose anything or very much. But uh, I can't see them doing anything which is going to harm the average guy they're going to want to make sure the average guy is happy with what's happening yeah i, I saw yesterday uh biden announced a 36 billion dollar uh bailout for the central states pension fund uh so yeah they're still yeah. they're doing bailing, right now bailing out pension funds is kind of part of part of the course for government so i think that's likely okay um this is a long question here. Let's see if I understood correctly. It sounds like the theory explained can be summarized with wealth will be punished. Uh, who owns not much or close to not much will see no differences since historically speaking, at least in my place, uh, owning houses and properties in general has always been considered by the government as one of the main source sources of wealth. If I may ask a couple of questions. Uh, is it likely that banks and governments will set free homeowners and mortgages instead of taking advantage of this reset to wipe out the slate clean, even on this field? Uh, and uh, in order to allow themselves to gain control over a wider portion of the housing market and consequently being able to have more influence on regular rents, market values, and subsidized housing. Uh, and then reducing private ownership was not one of the main points of the global reset itself. So he's talking about this reset. I think the, he's going down the uh, the road of whether the they want to leave, let people keep their properties. Let's continue though. Beside that, I heard that about a potential stop to the stock market for a little while. In this case, and considering the magnitude of the change, uh, like is it likely to expect a massive panic and partial collapse of most equities? Uh, since even people will be aware of the, uh, since even if people will be aware of the one-to-one -one conversion to the new CBDC, will that be enough to have everybody holding on uh, their positions until the mark settles down? Thanks a lot. A wonderful interview. Very high levels of content and insights always. Well, lo lots of questions, which I, I I think are really great questions because I think all your readers want to hear. Yeah. Uh, what, what the answer? Is. So the first one, one of the comments he makes is um, those who own not much uh, or close to not much will see no difference. I think that's true. And they might uh, or they'll certainly be told they're better off and they probably will feel better off if they get some free money from the government. So 
um, that. As for the wealthy being punished, um, that's not really the way history goes, um, at least not by those who make the make the rules. Um, so we mustn't forget the wealthy are the landowners. So uh, first of all, I think that rents will be re uh, reassigned into the new currency. So if you're paying a hundred pounds of rent today, you'll be paying 100 CBDC pounds in the future, whether you like it or not. Um, as for the mortgage, um, it would be very much in the best interest of the whole world and each government if these stay behind in the old currency. Uh, the banks won't be too bothered in a certain sense because the assets and liabilities will remain balanced. Um, the man in the street will be overwhelmed with joy because his mortgage is now in a withering away currency. Um, and when the man in the street has more equity in his house, he spends more. It's good for the economy. And that means more taxes for the government. They can lower tax rates and still collect more tax than they collected before. So in a way, if they can wipe out the debt of the of the world... That would be a very good thing for those who are in the habit of taking out debt. And that includes the man in the street, it includes companies, and it includes governments. Uh, it's a very bad thing for the holders of those debts, and there's going to be those bag holders, but we mustn't forget the uh, a lot of people are going to take the view that those who lost the money could afford to lose it. They're going to say, oh, it was such and such foreign government who held too many dollars or too many pounds, bad luck on them, but they, it doesn't really matter. They're going to say, oh, it was that millionaire, so-and-so, uh, he can afford it. And look, he's, made, he's he's got his company, he's got his houses, he's got his yacht, he's he's going to be fine. So a lot of people will take the view that the those who lost money uh, deserve to be, or deserve what happened to them. On the other hand, uh, those people, if they take the uh, optimistic view, they'll say, thank God I had my yacht and my house and my business because I didn't lose money. In, in fact, if I measure it in the old currency, I made money. Mm, that's right. That's right. So again, uh, what you said about holding uh, tangible uh, tangible assets. Uh, it's a way of surviving. It's, it's, yeah. you know, it, I, I think what everyone's going to try and do is get past this point, which is coming up, the reset point, and come out the other side, holding on to what they held before they went in. Uh, and that's the tricky way because it's it's not something where you can suddenly rejig your portfolio or rejig your assets around the world or whatever you have to own very, very quickly. If, the, if you're the man in the street, there's nothing much to do. But uh, the more you've got, the more you have to think about, have I got the right sort of assets in the right place? And you can't just sort of rush out and buy a ton of silver or, or a house here and there. It's not so easy as that. It takes time. Yeah. Uh, but what people need to do is be thinking about it and preparing themselves so they're better positioned uh, with ideally a very flat position by the time this comes. Yeah. Uh, there were a few more points this person made. I'm just uh, yeah. looking at his question. Um, uh, beside that, I heard a potential stop to the stock market for a while. And considering the magic magnitude of the change, it is, is it likely or it is likely to expect a massive panic and partial collapse of most of the equities? That's I'm really glad I got that question because um, I think it's likely prior to the reset. Well, let's say it's likely. It's possible. Uh, ahead of the reset, I think there'll be a lot of people in the know. And what are those people going to be doing? Well, they're going to be getting out of cash and bonds, and that causes a spike in interest rates. Interest rates start to go up. And as this rates going to start to go up, it seems to make assets un unattractive. That means other people, maybe not the people in the know, but other people will be selling their uh, equities because they're, they're getting margin calls or because they think they're going to go down forever or because there's a crisis in the world's about to end and you've got to get as much cash in, into your hands as possible. Um, so some people will definitely probably be more people selling equities in a rising, in a spiking interest rate environment than there are buying them. So we could see a crash in equities before we go into the reset. Um, we'll certainly see a troubled period after because people will have to rebalance their portfolios, uh, their cash 
the, the wealth for the wealthy. Their CAC balance will be gone. Their bonds will be gone. They'll have to rebalance their portfolio. That means selling equity, so they could go down some further. But once the dust has settled, we'll be in a new and very prosperous world where a lot of the debt which used to exist is wiped out and people can re, re, uh, restart. The government won't be, uh, if I just run through, um, for example, uh, some of the advantage for the government, um, it won't need to service the old national debt through taxes, at least not as much, because that will be in a currency which is unable to affect the economy, because to all intents and purposes, that old money is throttled, can't get into the new currency without permission or uh, unless you qualify in some way, and most people won't qualify. Um, so they can take on a – they'll be starting from a debt-to-GDP ratio of the new currency of zero. They can take on a lot of debt to bail out the pension funds, to give the, the universal basic income, and still be way, way below the levels of debt they're at today. Um, so the government will see a lot of advantages because they'll be, be able to spend money. They won't need to collect so much money from taxes to pay a national debt, which is defunct, because they can print away the old debt. So the government's going to be happy. Um, as far as companies are concerned, uh, if we have a total uh, uh, situation of everything stays in the old currency, except what you're allowed to convert, then you've got their bonds will remain in the old currency, not their cash. I mean, they're, they're, well, the cash will remain in the old currency too, but most companies have got cash on cash on one side and debt on the other side. So, and they've usually got more, not all, but many have got net debt. Yeah. So mostly companies will be happy because their net debt is going down in value as the old currency withers away and they'll be booking a foreign exchange loss in the first year and maybe the second year and eventually until it reaches zero. And that will be boosting their profits. Uh, so, from a company perspective, that's particularly good. But there's another thing which is going to be good for companies, and that is the individual having more money in his pocket. Because we also forget the individual, assuming they uh, do the same thing with mortgages, leave them behind in the old currency, he won't be servicing his mortgage with uh, expensive old money. He'll be servicing with very, very cheap, withering away old money, which he'll be able to buy uh, through the foreign exchange market, or if there's no foreign exchange market, maybe the black market. I don't think we'll have a black market. I think it'll be a genuine market. Um, he'll be able to buy the old currency at a very cheap price to service his debt. So he'll have more money in his pocket, which means he will be able to spend more. He'll have more equity in his house, which means he'll be able to spend more. And he, the government will be taking less taxes off him, which means he'll be able to spend more, which means we go into an economic boom, which is very, very good for companies, which means that when we get past the the troubles, the stock market probably is going to be a very, very good place to put your money. Uh, we're, we're going to see a booming, a, a real boom in the stock market. Um, and we've got plenty of illustrations uh, for that, uh, where we've had resets around the world uh, in the right way. Um, perhaps I, uh, I, I give you the example of uh, America in February 1933, a few months before they did the banning of gold. Um, they shut the banks. They shut the stock exchange for a week uh, because it was a crisis. People were nobody knew what was happening. There was riot, I don't know, the rioting in the streets, but there was certainly a lot of problems in America. And bank runs, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So pe people started to get wind of what was going to happen to gold. So when they reopened the stock market in February 1933. Oh, it might have been uh, early March. 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 March yeah. 14th, 14th of March, I think, yes. Yeah. It had the biggest one-day rise in all of history before and since. It never had a big, such a big one-day rise in all of history. And in the next three to six months, it went on to have the fastest 100% rise in all of history. Why? Because suddenly people were... Uh, seeing a new world where there was an economic reco recovery coming because they just printed a whole bunch of money um, through the uh, it was it was uh, further enhanced by the devaluation of the dollar on the 30th of January 1934, when the dollar was devalued by 58% in one day against foreign exchange currencies. Um, suddenly, the you know America became a very very attractive place uh, for exports. So I mean, for American companies could export their goods to the whole of Europe. Uh, okay, we were still in a war, um, but you know it was a, it, it boosted the American economy, and the stock market st just carried on up after after that. Yeah, um, so uh, I guess sorry to interrupt you. I, I guess 
the my the message would be right now is that uh, it's not about making a killing right now in the market. It's about preserving your wealth if you have any, and then getting through this. And then on the other side, if you still have something, you you will be in a good position. Exactly. Uh, I'm I am not planning to game the system in any way. Um, I know and I accept that I will be to some extent a loser when they have the currency reset because I will have currency and I'm going to explain why I will have currency and why you should have currency and why every one of the listeners should have currency at the time of the reset. Um, first of all, you can't know exactly when it happens. So when it, when it starts to happen, uh, you're going to have trouble doing anything because anything, everybody's going to be running around trying to do things. Um, but the second thing is you might go through a period when there's a lot of civil unrest and you need money to pay for things. You know, you might you might get, be having loans called in. You might have your credit card company reduce your, your line of credit. Uh, you might need to buy food. You might need to buy fuel. Uh, you might have some unforeseen expenses like medical expenses. If you have taken all your money and put it into house extension or firewood or whatever you think is a good – or silver coins, whatever you think is a good investment – what are you going to spend when you suddenly need that, when you suddenly have that medical experience, uh, 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 emergency, you need to spend some money? So people should keep some money behind because they don't know when it's going to happen and they might need it unexpectedly. And by, by keeping money or currency, you mean in the bank or also yeah. in your pocket or wh wherever under? Yeah. Under and and, uh, and by, by, by money, I mean whatever whatever is money to you um yeah. you know it doesn't mean to say you've got to keep money in your own currency yeah so you, you know if you're in britain you want to keep dollars and you're in america and you want to keep yeah. swiss francs uh, you know that's up to the yeah. individual to decide it doesn't have to be one currency it could be whatever it could be silver it could be gold yeah. it, well, however you think because we can always turn silver and gold at the moment yeah. into cash yeah okay uh wondering what would happen to gold coins with the queen's head that are currently capital gains exempt if the CBDC comes into place, perhaps the chancellor, chancellors or future chancellors, uh, new reduced allowances have been introduced for a reason, and all coins would be taxable. I think he's talking about the fact that cap, uh, the uh, exemption for capital gains is going to be dropped from twelve to six, and then to three. But right now, coins of the realm, they're not uh, capital gains. Uh, there's no liability for capital gains. Do you think they could change that? In many countries, or most countries, gold coins are free of VAT. Um, I didn't know that they're free of capital gains tax in the UK. They are, yeah. The sovereigns uh, in Britannia's. Anything with the, the monarch's head. So that obviously makes them a popular savings method for br the British. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't know that rule applies if you're an American. I don't think if you buy a coin with the president's head on, if there is one, uh, that you'll get any tax exemption. No, there uh, isn't in the U.S. Uh, in the U.K., it's uh, yeah, it's a good uh, thing. I think, uh, and, and one of the reasons I think it's like that is because uh, the people, the very very wealthy in the U.K., probably have a lot of these. But anything is possible. They they could put capital gains tax uh, on on gold. Go, uh, coins of the realm but what i would say is that um yeah uh, maybe you know there's uh as of now there isn't so i think it's still a good thing yeah so uh, what, what i think about gold and silver coins i think it, it's another asset into which people can diversify and it's an asset which could be turned back into cash quickly and easily in the world we live in today um so uh, but so can shares, so can bonds, so can many other things on the planet, not property. Uh, so it's a it's a very valid asset as part of a diversified portfolio. And in a situation where the there's uncertainty about the currency, precious metals tend to do better than other things. So it's probably not a bad environment to have at least a good exposure to that. And I don't want to say a percentage, but certainly zero is the wrong number. Mm. Um, we have to bear in mind 
governments might not like us earning gold, particularly if they decide to back the currency. Well, no, so I was say, not if they, decide, if they back, decide to back the currency by gold, that's great for the gold. But um, they might not like us earning gold if they're trying to outlaw alternative payment systems from existing. Um, in the United States, uh, they made it illegal in 19 in March or April, April 1980, uh, 5th of April it was, 1933. They made it illegal for Americans to hold any gold coin at all. So legally, you were not allowed to transport it. You were not allowed to use it. You were not allowed to import it. You were not allowed to export it. And you had a one-way ticket, which was you must hand it in to the bank, who would give you Federal Reserve notes. Nobody back then expected they'd have to wait until 1975 before they'd be allowed to freely buy gold again at um, five or ten times the price they'd sold it at 30 years earlier. Mm. 40 years earlier. Yeah. Uh, Diana White. Uh, hi, Mary. Just watched your show with Clive Thompson. He mentioned that cash is not something to hold, but what about physical cash? Since all currencies are mostly digital, wouldn't it retain some value in the short term? Uh, I guess you, you answered this question, so we can move on. But I, I can ask you a question, Mario. Yeah. Those lovely banknotes you showed me. Yeah. <laughs> Here they are. The, the the defunct ones. Yeah. How much are they worth to a collector? Uh, they could be worth 30, 40, 40 pounds. I mean, I've looked online. They might be worth a little bit, but they, they are in pristine condition. But the old ones are uh, probably not worth much. Um, there you are, Diana. You have your answer. Okay. If you do hold currency at home, make sure they're in pristine condition because they might have collector value one day. All right. Uh, Liam, what do you think about people buying XRP? Uh, XRP is Ripple. I don't know if you're familiar with that, Clive. Um, it will be used uh, to cross-border payments in the CBDC. I mean, there's a, a, a lot of uh, reaction to our first video was from people who who are into Ripple and how surprised uh, but uh, do you, have you got any views on XRP and Ripple? Um, yeah. Um, well, first of all, yeah. I did actually read. Uh, have we got an echo? That's okay. First of all, I did actually read the white paper back in must have been two thousand and eighteen. Uh, I didn't read a lot of white papers, but I, that was one I did, and I came to the conclusion back then. And things have changed, so let's go from there. Uh, back then, I came to the conclusion that it was the last currency or cryptocurrency on the planet I'd like to own, because I, as I saw it, banks wouldn't need more than 10 or $20 worth of it to do every transaction they'd ever have to do from now to eternity. Um, obviously, I'm not comparing the Ripple currency with the company Ripple, Ripple Inc., which is a business, um, which, is using, which used the Ripple uh, cryptocurrency to raise money to finance their business. Um, now, a lot of things are going on with Ripple with the U.S. court case about whether it's a security or not. And I believe that a lot of water has flown under the bridge in terms of what they intend to do with it. I am not privy to any of that. I don't know what it is. But what I can tell you is after we had our video, I was inundated with people uh, talking to me and saying, I really need to take a look at Ripple. That's all I can say. And I haven't looked at it. So I've got no no further comment. Than so, yeah. So what you're saying is... Uh... Yeah, Ripple is a good technology, but it doesn't mean to say that the Ripple coin will go through the roof if they use the Ripple technology, because it's going to be Ripple Inc. Who, that will benefit from it. Is that? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I haven't, I haven't. Whilst a lot of people were very, very um, yeah. convincing, I didn't feel the need to rush out and look at it as a priority. All right, good. Uh, in discussing CBDCs, if a wise man removes all. Uh, or most currency from banks puts it in the shoebox. Uh, will that currency be a good uh, at a local level on, on kind of a black market basis? Uh, I mean, I won't read. Yeah, we'll continue. But the other, the thing I would say, yeah, again, look at these. <laughs> it might be good for a, a little while, but I don't think it will be good for uh, a, a year in a year's time. Uh, when there's confusion, people will still accept it. Uh, I understand cash will be allowed to remain in the system, but Lynette Zhang uh, has indicated a possibility of putting RFID chip in it, uh, something that can locate uh, the money to your household, connect 
uh, connect it to a transaction. Will older currency have some extra value because of its untraceability? No. Okay. <laughs> Short. Yeah. Will selling the uh, uh, selling gold to a shop incur some prying eyes into the process as the money is tra transferred back to the CBDCs? Will yes. there be tax liabilities or even? Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, and and criminal liabilities? No, unless they decide that gold and silver is outlawed, as is heroin. Uh, I don't. I think that's rather unlikely. Yeah. But nothing. Nothing is impossible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so if a CBDC gets shoehorned in, uh, even on a one-to-one -one basis, will held cash carry on being legal tender? Will our new digital wallets allow us to acquire precious metals? Harry zero one five six. Well, I don't see why. I don't see why not. Um, precious metals aren't really in uh, in a competitive state to the government, unless, of course, the government's backing the currency by precious metal, in which case um, we have the situation we had in America back in the 1930s, uh, whereas Roosevelt said um, we America has hypothecated itself in terms of what it owes in gold, not only for more gold than exists in the whole of the United States, but in fact for more gold than exists in all of the world and two times over. Um, so, you know, in that sort of scenario, uh, they, they might want to uh, make gold illegal. But in a situation where we have a CBDC, which is not, in fact, linked to the gold price, uh, and some say it will be, but I don't know if it will, um, I would say that we don't really have a problem. Gold should be, you should be able to buy and sell it. And in any case, even in America, there was one type of coin which you could keep, and that was known as collector's coins. Yeah, that's right. That's uh, I think it was the Secretary of the Treasury during that confiscation. He was a coin collector, so he put that in. So, <laughs> uh, I think one of them decided to become a dentist because dentists yeah. were allowed to buy gold. Yeah. Uh, will this reset be worldwide or just Western world? Uh, no, I guess we've spoken about that. It's going to be worldwide. Yep. No, you know, no country really can stay outside that unless they want to become totally isolated. Uh, hi, Mary. What if they raise interest rates in the old currency to 100 percent or more? Uh, that would really stuff everyone who has debt on their homes or their houses. Um, that's a very good point. Let's just think what happened back um, when Britain was um, exiting the ERM. Or, well, it was trying to stay in the ERM. Uh, we had interest rates at about, I, I may have got the numbers slightly wrong because I'm speaking from memory here. Interest rates were about 8% and uh, the powers that be were betting that uh, Britain's finances weren't good enough to stay in the ERM. So they were selling the pound short using borrowed money. So the Bank of England tried to screw them around, and in the morning they raised the interest rates from I think from eight to ten, and or yeah, uh, yeah I think they raised it to fifteen, Clive. I remember that's right. Oh. Uh, you're right, but th that happened in several stages. And this, yeah. on the same day, it was like eight, ten, and then twelve in the, twelve in the afternoon, and then fifteen percent, yeah. uh, and then by the evening, I think, or by the next day, they reversed that decision yeah. because the pound collapsed and the pound dropped. I don't know, ten or twenty or thirty percent. It was a huge collapse in one day. Um, as Britain decided to abandon the ERM and interest rates came back down quick, very, very quickly. And I think they even went below the level they were before because Britain was no longer trying to pump up the level of the pound. So, yes, will we see 100% interest rates? Um, it's, you know, you've, you've seen it in many countries in South America. Um, it could happen. Uh, will it affect your mortgage? Well, if you have a fixed rate mortgage, no. If you have a variable rate mortgage, um, I don't know if that's allowed in the UK. Um, it certainly is in some countries where you can have a link to what used to be called LIBOR. I think they call it here in Switzerland. Then they call it SARON, um, but they, it's, it's a money market type rate. Then if money market rates go up, your mortgage will go up if it's linked to money market. So one of the things I forgot to say for those who do not take my advice and want to game the system by taking out debt, if you're deciding to take out debt to game the system, then at least make sure that your lender cannot call in your loan and make sure that the interest rate is fixed for as long as you can fix it for. Because if it's not, and we suddenly find your loan matures on a day when the interest rates are very high, 
they will push the interest rate up on you and you might get a margin call anyway. And uh, you might find you're being forced to sell your assets at the worst possible time just before the reset happens. Okay. Uh, there's an aspect no one's talking about. How will CBDC affect extra? Le oh, well, I think we spoke about that. That that was the question that I asked you about extra legal activities like drugs, prostitution, or gambling. So we'll, we'll uh, skip that and go to the last questions. Uh, last question, excuse me. But aren't CBDCs programmable, meaning it's not my money, but the government's, and thus they can con constrain my purchasing power base on policies and what I buy? So from everything we hear, CBDCs are going to be programmable, and the, the extent of programming will improve and change over time, when I say improve, maybe not for you and I, but uh, improve from the government's perspective, uh, it'll have better tracking, it'll have expirability, they'll be able to tell you that every cent ending in the letter E, for example, is now no longer valid as a one-off emergency tax. Um, they'll be able to give you free money and tell you have to spend it before a certain date or it will expire, like coupons. Uh, when you get coupons for a shop and they say you get money off if you go before Wednesday, they'll, the government will be able to do that to you. Um, uh, there'll be a lot of, uh, lot of rules which they can write in. Um, from a government's perspective, it'll give them a much better way of managing the economy than they have at the moment. So the ups and downs of the economy if the government gets its uh, way, should be less so than we've seen in the past uh, because they'll be able to instantly affect how people behave, whereas the old traditional way is very clunky. They have to change the interest rates on the banks and the banks then adjust the interest mm -hmm. rates on you and it takes a long time to work its way through the system and the banks can't say, spend your money now or we'll, we'll confiscate it, whereas the government will be able to do that. Yeah, I, I mean, it's not the, a world that uh, we look forward to too much, but unfortunately... Uh, we might not be able to avoid it. And, and I, I think the best way to avoid it is try to keep a lot of your assets outside the, the system. You can you still be able to do that in, in that system, just like you can today. Uh, the other day, uh, Clive, uh, I have a NatWest app on my phone for my account. And uh, I opened it to, to check my account. And there was like a, a notice, like a, a, and it said, uh, click here to track uh, your um, carbon footprint for every transaction that you do. They're already pushing it, even that West. And, and I, I deleted it. I didn't want to go into it. I mean, so they could program it. Yeah, you've uh, you bought too much uh, steak from this uh, steak uh, website. You know, I, I, there is a website that I like uh, buying steaks from. So you never know. But Clive, uh, I'd like to thank you for coming on again. I think uh, you uh, answered a lot of questions. I'm sure people will still have a lot of questions, but I guess we could uh, uh, do another uh, interview later on and even talk about uh, the man that was probably, I think, uh, after look, I'm watching a program about him, the, and I won't say the name, but I, I think he was the Sam Bankman Friedman, uh, Freed of the 1920s, and no one's heard about him. Exactly. All right. That's, uh, that, well, another day, that would be a great story we could yeah. tell. Um, I think the whole world has never heard the story. It was one of the greatest frauds in all of history and ended up with the one of the key players becoming Lord Mayor of London. I'll say no more. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Clive. Have a great day, and I'll talk to you later. Cheers. Bye-bye.